Okay, this is part eight. Part eight in the Mark series, going verse by verse through the entire book of Mark, covering theology, apologetics, historical insights, uh, and simple verse by verse contextual teaching. Not to miss application. Uh, it's on my heart that we obviously focus on that aspect as well as I think it's kind of like loving God with your heart and your mind. And that's my one of my goals in the teaching that I'm bringing here. So this week, quick overview. It's nice to tell you what I'm going to tell you. We're going to talk about a supposed contradiction in the Gospel of Mark. We're going to talk about Jesus being accused of blasphemy. Interesting. Jesus' first use of the title Son of Man. And we're going to survey every use of the title Son of Man that Jesus has in the Gospel of Mark. Very briefly, that'll just be, it's a fun thing to do, actually. And not just another healing, but there is a healing. But it's not just another healing. And what we'll see is that when Jesus does things, it's to reveal truths to us. And so it's important that we do that, that we don't just look at the healings and go like, what do I do with this? Have you ever experienced that in the Gospels? Like, what do I do with this healing? Okay, there's another healing. What do I do with that? Well, we, we should let the text tell us what to do with it and then do that with it. That's the point. And we'll also talk about beautiful truths about forgiveness and prayer. And so here we are. We're just going to read. Here's our first read through. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. We're just going to plow through the whole, <clears throat> whole section of the text, and then we're going to analyze it in, in more depth. So Mark 2, verse 1. But when he had come back to Capernaum, several days afterwards, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone, so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. So here's the big picture as we just kind of plow through the whole thing. I don't want to miss the big picture as I analyze the little details, right? The big picture is Jesus heals a paralytic, but he does it for an express purpose. He does it to prove something about himself, and that was that he has the power to forgive sin. Did you catch that? The, the, the entire thing, the whole setup that Jesus does when he forgives the man before healing him, which seems odd at first, is so that he can set them up. Hey, I forgive you. Oh, and now so you know I have the authority to forgive. Get up and walk. That's the main idea. Jesus' works and teachings are meant to get you to believe in Jesus. That's the idea. Like what he's done gets you to believe that he can forgive you. That sounds pretty Christian to me. <laughs> this is pretty much the basic gospel message right here, is that you trust in Jesus because he is the one who can forgive you. That's the bottom line. Now let's go through it because there's a whole lot more than that overview or that big picture stuff. So Mark 2 verse 1. When he come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. Notice that word home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. So he's at home, at home, at Capernaum, at home. But wait a minute. This is where a supposed contradiction comes up. And, and I've heard people say things like this are contradictions. Oh, Jesus, his home was Nazareth, not Capernaum. But here Mark thinks Jesus' home was Capernaum. So obviously Mark is confused. Mark doesn't even know where Jesus is from. He doesn't understand this. So it's obviously a contradiction. Now, oftentimes... You'll get contradictions like this suggested, especially in the day and age of the internet where we live now. It used to be people would say, the Bible's full of contradictions, and you'd say, well, give me an example. And they'd be like, well, you know, there's a lot of examples. I just don't know any of them. But now they just do a quick Google search, and they just send you a link. Or they'll, or they'll cut and paste something, you know, 
And so then you'll get those examples and then you have a little bit more work cut out for you as a Christian. You know, it's because you have to actually go and like look this thing up and see if it's really a contradiction. Oftentimes, though, that's as far as skeptics go. They'll present contradictions, but they haven't actually evaluated them themselves. In my experience, this is pretty much always the case. Just about every time, they haven't even looked at the passages in context to see if these are really contradictory or not. Oftentimes, they prefer questions to answers. Haha, how does this happen? And then run away. <laughs> or run to another question. And that's all there is to it. This is the single biggest issue I've seen in questioners or in sometimes skeptics. The single biggest issue is when they don't actually want an answer to their question. Now, I'm not assuming this about people. I'm saying it becomes evident when they get an answer, whether they wanted it or not. What happens when you answer their question? Are they frustrated or are they satisfied? Oh, well, oh, that's a good answer. I guess it's not a contrary. Or, or are they like, oh, yeah? Oh, you got me on that one, Batman, but riddle me this. You know, and they're going to give you another, another question, a new uh, challenge that you have to. And if you answer that, does it just give you another one? And if you answer that, they just give you another one? And, and they're not like at all impressed that their three objections have all been answered, but yet they'll often use these same objections again and again and again. And I say this is indicative that there is a heart issue going on above and beyond the supposed intellectual challenges. I actually found an atheist website that had a list of supposed Bible contradictions. And as a, as a heading, before they went into the contradictions, they said, now Christians will try to explain these contradictions away using things like context, or historical analysis, or understanding the original languages. And I was like, on what planet is it wrong to use context, historical analysis, and understanding the original language? Like, what world do you live in where something that most of us would call scholarship is considered mock-worthy, you know? And that's, unfortunately though, that's, that's often the case. Um, so let's evaluate the supposed contradiction here. So Mark, Mark says Jesus actually was from Nazareth. Did you know that? The, the gospel of Mark itself, in Mark 1 verse 9, in Mark 1 verse 24, in Mark 10 47, in Mark 14 67, and in Mark 16 16, Jesus is from Nazareth over and over and over again. And the first thing I'll say is, now you might say, well, there you go, that proves it. Mark 2 says he's, he's, his home is in Corinth, or in uh, Capernaum, but all these other passages in Mark say he's, his home is in Nazareth. So Mark's contradicting himself. And all I, I'm going to offer this as a suggestion, as a nice rule of thumb for when we see supposed contradiction of an author disagreeing with himself. It's okay to assume authors aren't morons. It's okay to think the author's probably not totally brain dead. When he says two things that seem contradictory, it might be that you're misunderstanding what he's trying to communicate. That would be one possibility. It's like in the book, The Tale of Two Cities, which I never read, but it famously opened by saying it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. I mean, obviously this author doesn't know what kind of time it was. <laughs> he doesn't know if it was the best of times. He doesn't know if it was the worst of times. The author's a total moron, apparently, or there's something else going on here. Um, well, in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 31, we get some more information about Nazareth, Jesus' hometown, Nazareth. And <clears throat> I'm not going to read through the whole passage, but when Jesus comes to his hometown, he announces himself as the Messiah, right? He reads from Isaiah and says, this day, this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. And then they reject him. They reject him. And so he leaves, right? And the reason they reject him is interesting is because they knew him. Hey, isn't this Jesus? Don't we know his brothers, sisters, mom? Like, we, we know them, right? Son of the carpenter. Isn't this Jesus? Like, we know this guy. And so they reject him. And on a side note, in ministry, especially those of us who serve, have served in ministry for years, um, we have a tendency to maybe have low expectations of people we know. Because we know their flaws, or we know the times that they've failed, and we, we know some of their weaknesses. And I try to, like, unbrain my, unbrainwash myself of that, when I look at people and try to have a hopeful attitude about their potential and how they can serve the Lord, especially with the leading of the Holy Spirit in their lives, that people who you normally would have thought, they couldn't do that. And that you, yeah, if the Lord anoints them for that, if God em empowers them to do that, absolutely they can. I mean, how am I doing this? 
you know, how am I doing whatever I'm doing? Um, and so it's, it's good to have a positive attitude. Now, of course, they didn't know Jesus's failings or weaknesses. They just knew Jesus and they had whatever prejudices they had. So he left there. In Matthew 4, 13, we read this. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. So Jesus, he settles in Capernaum. He leaves Nazareth, settles in Capernaum. It became like a second home base. He didn't like buy a home there, I don't think. I don't think that happened at all. So though Jesus settled there, he didn't own a home. Why, do, why would I say that? Well, verse 1 in Mark 2, Mark 2, 1, it says he went, he was at home. They found out he was at home. But what home are we talking about? Well, that was already introduced. It's a home that is known to the reader of Mark already. It was introduced in Mark chapter 1 when Jesus was hanging out in Capernaum at Peter's house. And Peter's mother-in-law was sick and he heals her. And then everybody gathers to that house and then he's gone. And then the next time he's at Capernaum there, he's at home. So he goes there. So it seems that Peter's home is the home Jesus has gathered at. And that home was like a base of operations while he was in Capernaum. It was known that he would be there. Interestingly enough, it, and this is a maybe, this is just a maybe, it might be more evidence that Peter is a source behind Mark, that Mark just refers to it as home, because that's kind of how Peter would have talked about it. Right? If Peter's telling the story about how Jesus was in Capernaum, oh, they found out he was at home. Because that's the place Peter's been calling home forever. And so it's just an interesting side note. I think it might add more credence to the idea of uh, Peter as the source behind Mark. So next thing is this. Why are so many people gathered there? Why are so many people gathered there? Well, if you flash back to Mark chapter 1, when the initial visit happened, um, this is what it says. Mark 1.35. Um, by the way, let me give you, I'll give you the quick recap, right? Jesus casts out a demon. He teaches with authority, casts out a demon. Then he heals Peter's mother-in-law. And then at the end of the day, after the Sabbath is over and sun, sun has set, now everybody comes to the house, right? To, to seek healing or seek help or to hear Jesus teach. But it says early in the morning, this is Mark 135. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Simon and his companions searched for him. They found him and said to him, everyone's looking for you. Everyone who? All, all the people at Capernaum. He said to them, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is why I came, uh, what I came for. And he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out the demons. So he goes throughout all Galilee, and then in Mark chapter 2, verse 1, who knows how much time has gone by. He's back at Capernaum, and they hear, oh, he's back at the house, the same house he was at before. And so then they all come. This is why the crowd crams around Peter's house the second time. Who knows what else happened between Mark 1 and Mark 2? We don't know. We're obviously getting a very truncated, very shortened version of Jesus's ministerial life. Mark is the shortest of the Gospels. Then in verse 2, there's this really interesting phrase. And notice what it, how it describes what Jesus teaches. It just says, he was speaking the word to them. Jesus's teaching is just called the word. Like this seems to be a, like a, a, pr a proper elevation of what Jesus taught. It's just the word. He taught them the word. The words of Jesus seem to be like on par with the word of God here. Is, is, is the things, are the things that Jesus is saying, are they inscripturated yet? Have they been written down? That's what that word inscripturate means when you put it in writing. Has it been put down into scripture yet? No, but it is in fact God's message. It's God's word. He is, everything he communicates, of course, is God's word to people. And what happens when you take these words of God that Jesus has taught to his disciples and they finally get it written down? Well, you have the word of God written down. Uh, the idea of the inspiration and the authority of the New Testament documents comes to the authority of Jesus. That's my point. And I think that, uh, um, you know, it's a good case for why we don't have continued writing of Scripture is because Jesus isn't still teaching anything. And whatever he taught was written down, and that's it. The authority came from him because he was the one teaching the Word. Any, um, any case for the authority of Jesus and the authority of the original apostles being delivered to them through Jesus, it's a case for the authority of the New Testament as well, ultimately. Some people like to say about this 
that the early church didn't have a Bible. I've heard this a lot recently. Have you heard this? Oh, the church didn't even have a Bible for 300 years. There was no Bible. Well, then what was Jesus teaching them? Like, it's, it's not like there was this total vacuum. And we just knew nothing for hundreds of years. And all of a sudden, someone handed me like a, like a bound Bible, right? Like, oh, look, oh, finally I have something. I mean, first off, they had the Old Testament, and it was never without it. They had the teachings of Jesus and the apostles, and the early church was never, ever without those things. When they were written down and then circulated, it was just a continuation of what Jesus and the apostles had done when they were alive. So there was nothing new about the written text. It was just permanent. That was the nature of, of it. It went from, from uh, being orally transmitted to being written down. So there was, there's just no point, no time in the early church when they were truly without the word of God. There's no point. Here's Jesus delivering it right there. Even Peter recognized Paul's words as scripture. Interestingly enough, really interesting passage in uh, 2 Peter 3.16, he talks about Paul's writings and how people twist them. And then he says, as they also do the rest of scripture. And this is just profound that Peter writes that what Paul wrote was scripture, was the written word of God. That, that's Yep, I think that's pretty profound. Pretty profound stuff. So it's interesting that Peter, in the first century, while he's still alive, he thinks that the church has scripture already. Written scripture by the hand of Paul already. It didn't take 300 years. It was already there. Anywho, I just thought that was a fun side note to share with you guys. So then there's this profound healing moment, and this healing moment's meant to teach us central truths about Jesus. Um, and it may help those of us who struggle with what to do with the miracles of Jesus. Like as we evaluate this, it may help you. Because I remember too, me reading, you know, the gospels and just going like, what am I supposed to do application wise? You know, with this next miracle story of Jesus, I've heard that kind of thing. This might help a little bit. I once knew a pastor who, uh, heard a pastor teaching who said that when he was a new Christian, he'd open up his Bible and there he would read, you know, something that Jesus did. And see, he'd healed a leper. Oh, and then he would like go out that day and try to do that. And I don't really know how you find lepers very well nowadays. But, but the point is that he had this just full of zeal. Full of zeal. But I just imagine his days largely being disappointments. And him not knowing why. And I would say because you were just not doing proper Bible study. Jesus doesn't want you to open the Bible read something he did, and then go try and do it that day, as exciting as that may sound, I don't think that's proper Bible study. Right? What happens when you read the passage where he gets crucified? I want to go do that today. I mean, what, what goes on, right? When you read the passage where Jesus says, I'm only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and you're like, today I'm only talking to Jewish people. It just doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's sincere, but it's maybe a little bit naive. And it has you experimenting on the unsaved in an effort to affirm your own spirituality, which is never a good thing. Ministry is not about me affirming my own spirituality. And you guys know what I mean? We can actually try to serve the Lord as a way of alleviating our insecurities instead of a way of just serving Jesus. And that's the kind of thing that can result. Oftentimes, the miracles that we read about aren't things we're trying to go necessarily go reduplicate, although we believe in a God who does miracles. I'm just saying you're not looking at it as a blueprint to go out and try to practice or copy something. Um, <clears throat> they're often teaching us about Jesus. That's the thing. They're teaching us something about Jesus, not meant to create anxiety in you, not to confuse your expectations about your walk with Christ or how you're supposed to live and do ministry. It's not necessarily trying to give you a pattern to reduplicate. It's interesting how Jesus keeps healing in different ways all the time. If he healed people consistently the same ways all the time, then you would, you would maybe be more prone to try to turn it into a pattern. Oh, it does this and this and then that. Okay, I'm going to do those three things. But I think that, that uh, the Lord kept that from us on purpose. I think that what Jesus did is about teaching us truths of Christ and truths of God's kingdom, not necessarily trying to give us patterns to follow in that anxiety-inducing um, self-affirming way. So let's see what we can learn from this one. Verse 3. What can we learn from this miracle? And they came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four men, being unable to get him, uh, get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. 
So it's five guys, four, four friends carrying the one friend who's the paralytic. So five guys all together. And it's just too crowded. The, the house isn't that big. They can't get inside anymore. There's too many people there. So they go through the roof and they lower him down. And this is where, again, I've heard the scoffers go to town on this passage. Oh, they just ripped the roof off. That, that makes total sense, right? Like, could you just imagine? They came to the building and, oh, it's too many people here. So they climb up on the roof somehow with a paralyzed man. How'd you get the paralyzed guy on the roof? You ever tried that before? Come on. Come on. And then they go in there. And how exactly did they rip the roof apart? You ever tried ripping a roof apart? Like, what was, did, did beams fall down and crush people down below? What was going on here? And I've heard people just go to town on this. And this is where I'm going to use the forbidden device of historical insights to try to understand what's really happening in this passage so that we don't say, oh, it's impossible. It's obviously a legend. That's, that's the conclusion that some, uh, some people would come to when they read this passage. And I'll say the first problem is they're picturing a modern house and a modern roof in a modern city. And none of those things are true in the first century at Capernaum when this is going on. Typical homes in that region involved a low, flat roof that was a normal place to chill during the day. You go up there to relax, just like we read in Acts about how Peter, he's relaxing and in prayer meditation on the roof of the house in the middle of the day. You'd go up there to cool off, right? Sometimes the home gets hot and retains that heat and you go up on the roof and you hang out. It was actually normal for these roofs to be accessible through an external stairway. This is just normal. It's standard because that's what you do. You go up there and you get up on the roof and you hang out and you relax. The roof, so that's how you could get up with your friends. There's a stairway. The roof was actually not constructed like our modern roofs are. It did have beams that were maybe about three feet or so apart. In between the beams, you had branches and mud that were just filler in the roof. Sometimes you'd put tiles on top on the roof. It seems like this might have been a roof with tile because it says they removed the roof and dug it out, which is a perfect description of how this would have happened. You just grab the tiles and pull them off and then literally you could just dig through the roof. It wouldn't have costed much. Uh, it wouldn't probably cost anything. You'd just go get branches and mud and you repair the roof later. They would lower, have lowered their friend down through the three foot or so space that would have been between the beams. So um, was it disruptive? Yeah. Was it unheard of? No. Was it incredibly difficult? No. Um, did it take some, some ingenuity? Yeah. And some commitment? Oh, yeah, you better believe it. It's interesting that the NASB, it actually puts it this way. They dug an opening. They dug an opening in verse 4. Um, that's to communicate the real meaning of the Greek word there. The NASB, they like to try to be really clear about the Greek when they can. And it, it actually means to dig out literally to dig out in the Greek. Uh, other translations don't put it that way as much, but it wasn't actually that hard to fix. And so I guess it doesn't have to be legend because it fits perfectly into the culture and the context and the whole history and all that stuff. But why such urgency? Why not just wait? Right? Like, why not just wait till Jesus comes out, dude? Just relax. You know, your friend's not going anywhere. <laughs> Get it? It's paralyzed. Um, but the urgency, I think, makes sense because the last time Jesus was in Capernaum, they were all gathered. Perhaps they were thinking, we'll see him tomorrow. And he took off early in the morning. He left. And he didn't come back for who knows how long. Now he's back. The crowd's there. We can't get our friend to him, but we believe this man can heal him. Let's go up on the roof and let's just dig a hole and lower him down. We just got to get our friend to Jesus. That's the idea. We've got to get him to Jesus. I think the big point here that we can learn from this is that there's something here about faith that we need to learn. It's in verse 5 where it says Jesus saw their faith, seeing their faith. Healing and forgiving are here both in response to faith. Now, some take this faith, like who is it that had faith? They take it to be the friends. The four friends had faith. Um, well, it is in the plural. It says their faith, not just his faith, their faith. But I don't think we should exclude the paralyzed man's faith like he didn't have faith. I think we're making a, a dangerous assumption when we say that. I think five people had faith. Personally, I doubt that the man was taken there against his will. Right? I, I, I mean, I suppose they could have, but I don't, 
Could you imagine? You're going to church with me today, bub, and you can't help it because you're paralyzed. So <laughs> good luck. Um, I don't think so. And it turns into something weird if I say that Jesus saw the four friends' faith and he healed the paralyzed man. Wait a minute. So if enough of my friends believe, I can be forgiven? He forgives the man, right? He not just healed him, but forgave him. If enough of my friends are believing, then I can be forgiven? That's, okay, now we're getting some weird theology at that point. Absolutely not. We each must have faith independently, individually. And so... Um, uh, an example of this is Paul in Romans chapter 10. He talks about how much he loves his countrymen according to the flesh. And he's like, I would, I could wish myself a curse for Christ for their sakes. And they have zeal, but not according to knowledge. Because being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness. And so he goes on to describe how they're not saved as much as he loves them and as much faith as he has. It doesn't transfer. Faith isn't, isn't contagious in that sense. <laughs> it doesn't transfer over. People do sometimes catch it. They get inspired. But, um, but I can't have faith for other people. They have to do it. So these miracles, I think, <clears throat> I think this particular miracle is giving us an example of like this active faith, this seen faith. That's that phrase, seeing their faith. I think that's highlighted in the text. And man, it was active, right? They were so um, committed to getting their friend to Jesus, believing that this was worth it, believing that it, he could be healed, that they're willing to dig the, a hole through the roof and, and lower him down. And I think the man had faith too, because don't you think he would have been scared? You're going to lower me down? Like imagine four of your friends. Just pick four, any four of your friends. And you know this man was scared. <laughs> you know it was intentional. It was active faith. And I think the lesson here for us, the application is this, is sometimes we have a bit of a lazy faith, a, a bit of a passive faith. It's like, Lord, I believe, but I'm not actually like seeking. I'm not like actively pressing forward to seek the Lord. I know if I pursue God and his word, I'll be blessed. I know if I spend that time in prayer that God will answer. Like we're not really intentful about our faith. We're just kind of going along like God will do what he's going to do. And my activity of faith isn't going to have a big impact. That's kind of sometimes how we live. And I think that that's a, a lazy and maybe a bit of an emaciated kind of thing that happens to us. It's not good. Jesus talked about how we need to be asking and seeking and knocking. Hebrews eleven six, it says, Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That like if I'm pressing forward and seeking the Lord in prayer and in, in reading his word and in serving him in ministry and in being faithful to resist temptation even though, oh, I want to so bad. If I'm being faithful to honor God in my life in the situations that just seems like they won't change and they won't get any better and this and that, I'm just like actively, actively faithful before the Lord. God's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Let me give you guys some more encouragement on this because I think we need it. I think I need it and I think you need it. Our faith is supposed to be driving us to action is the idea. So in Luke chapter 11, in fact, please turn there, Luke chapter 11. I want to read uh, several verses. One of the parables of Jesus here, talking about, well, let's just read it. Luke 11, verse 5. Then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend. And goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside he answers and says, don't bother me. The door has already been shut and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. So you catch the picture, right? You're knocking on your friend's door. It's nighttime. They're in bed. They're like, leave me alone. And you're like, oh, but your need is so strong. So he goes on. Verse 8, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened. The, the clear context of the phrase of ask, seeking, knocking is persistence. It's like you just don't quit. You won't quit. 
I'm not going to quit praying for this. I'm not going to quit seeking the Lord on this. I'm not going to quit appealing to God on this. And Jesus often makes these extreme one-sided points. He does this frequently, okay? It is one-sided. It is extreme. That doesn't mean there's nothing else to prayer, like the limits of what God's will is for your life. We're not talking about bending and breaking God's will to make him do things for you. This is a one-sided extreme statement by Jesus, but it is meant to highlight the idea that I'm supposed to push forward in prayer, push forward in seeking God, just keep going and going and going, like a sense of persistence in the things that I'm doing. And I'm personally still reconciled to the idea, it's okay, if God, if you don't wanna do that, that's fine. But there is nothing wrong with me just pressing on and asking and pushing forward in prayer. I don't have to quit. Verse 11, <clears throat> it says, now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. Will he not give him a snake instead of a fish? Or he will not, excuse me. He will not give him a snake uh, instead of a fish. Will he? Or if he's asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your, will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And the specific promise here is about the Holy Spirit. But the, now couple these two together. You have one that's about persistence. Even if your friend doesn't care enough about you to get up out of bed, but if you just keep rattling his door, like he'll eventually get up and give you whatever you want just to get you to go away. Like he uses this extreme example. Now to rescue you from the idea that like, so God, if I annoy you enough, like that's not the message. And to rescue you from that, he has the next parable, right? Hey, come on. God's a good father. He wants to give you good things. He'll give you the Holy Spirit. So he's not being, we're not twisting his arm, but he does want us persistent. Then one more parable, let's look at to help us get the point. In Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Luke 18, 1 is like my go-to verse for prayer. Now as, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll, I'll give you a second to get there. Or, or s flip there. Scan there. How many of you guys use your phones? I'm just curious. Is it easier that way? So Luke 18, verse 1. It's easier when I don't give you time to find the book. Huh? Um, now as he was, or now he was telling them in a parable. <clears throat> let me start over. Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. I don't have to tell you the point of this parable. At all times pray and don't lose heart. The danger the thing that you might lose in your prayer life is heart. And this parable is that you wouldn't do that. Like this thing we're about to read is so that you won't lose your, your, your sense of hopefulness about the God that you are, you are like making requests of. That's the idea. And look at what he says. Saying, in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city. And she kept coming to him saying, give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while, he was unwilling. But afterward, he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said? Now will, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night and he will delay long over them, or will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The idea is that God will, will answer those prayers. You can be sh sure of it. You can be certain of it. So continue to pray and don't lose heart because there's an eventual yes to the deliverance of every Christian. It's an eventual yes to every Christian. To all of the problems, there's an eventual deliverance. So don't lose heart. I always ought to pray and not lose heart. In particular, when God is delaying his help, when there's a delay. He's like, hey, here's the parable. This unjust judge, he'll help her out. Won't God help you out? He has his own reasons for some delay. And <clears throat> verse 8, Jesus then asks a question that I think is pretty profound. He says, However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? When that deliverance finally comes, when Jesus' final kingdom arrives, 
will he find us trusting and waiting or will he find us like acting like he was never going to come? Will we have lost heart about the hopefulness that we have as Christians because we can only see what we're going through and we can't see what we're going to? We can only see what we're experiencing now and we can't see the glory of eternity that is coming. So the question I have is not, will my prayer get answered this time? But will he, have, will he, will he find faith in me or will he find that I've lost heart? That's the question. Look to the second coming of Jesus, not just to the immediate answer of your prayers. I think that's another side note that's in there. Look to the second coming of Jesus so you don't lose heart. Because it's as certain as his first coming. The one who rose from the dead is going to come back and finish and do everything he said. And um, we need that hope. Now that's, that's the men, right? They're, they're, like, they're, they're, they're active in their faith. They go out there and, and Jesus looks at the man and his response to them is, is you know, hey, you're forgiven. In fact, this, this is, we'll compare these two different groups now. The, 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 the people that brought their friend as well as the paralyzed man who has faith. And then there's the leadership. And in verse 5 is when everything shifts. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Son, your sins are forgiven. And the first thing that occurs to most of us is like, but wait, but he's paralyzed. Like, he didn't come for forgiveness. He came for healing. That's the first thing that we notice. But Jesus is doing this all on purpose. It's all quite deliberate. I think it's an entire setup by the Holy Spirit. The whole thing's planned out and it's beautiful. One of the reasons is this, is that between being paralyzed and being forgiven, one of them is the greater need and one of them is the greater felt need. And I think that Jesus is drawing a contrast. He's showing us, hey man, you have these physical issues going on. And I mean, let's not understate what it must be like to be paralyzed. Like imagine, seriously, imagine what this is like. Yet as difficult as that is, as hard as that is, and as much as he needs healing, forgiveness was a bigger deal and a bigger blessing to bestow upon him, for sure. Jesus is constantly confronting this issue that we have our great needs that we're ignoring and we have the things that we want that are more important to us. And we kind of go like, I know, I know, I know, to the wonderful blessings of Christ and I need, I need, I need to things that are very temporary in nature. I think that we don't see these needs. The spiritual needs is the result of some kind of serious spiritual blindness that a lot of us have. In John 16, 8, we read that the work of the Holy Spirit in, in um, not just the believer, but the non-believer, the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. You ever thought about that? Why on earth? Is the work of the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come? Why isn't, why isn't the Holy Spirit there to convict us of God's love? Because if you tell someone who thinks they don't have sin issues, that God is not righteous, and that there is no judgment for them, if you tell them God loves them, they're like, of course he does. I'm a, I'm a lovable guy. <laughs> like, I'm great. But if you, if you tell someone who understands sin, righteousness, and judgment that God loves them, it's like this salve that they need. Oh, there is grace. Oh, there is mercy. Like my heart's prepared for the gospel. When I hear that, that word forgiveness, I realize it's the most beautiful word I've ever heard. Because I know of my sin, I know of God's righteousness, and I know that there's coming judgment. I'm a sinner, he's righteous, and I'm going to be judged. And so we get uh, made aware, even by the work of the Holy Spirit, of our incredible need for forgiveness. But it's this aspect of the gospel that I think a lot of people want to downplay. And so the gospel can be this thing where it's like God loves you so much. He loves you. He loves you. Your sins are forgiven. And then somewhere in the back of their heads, people are kind of like, what do you mean my sins are forgiven? Like, what sins? Are you saying I'm not a good person? Oh, well, I'm not, I mean, I'm just, I'm not, I'm no better than you. I don't know. Oh, I didn't want to offend you. I think that was my problem. I didn't want to offend you. I'm sorry. If you think you're a good person, you're going to be offended by the gospel. Because in the end, you're not. And so I'm telling you something pretty negative about yourself, but I got the work of the Holy Spirit helping me. Because you know you've sinned, right? And there is a righteous God, and there is future judgment. And so this is part, just part of the gospel message. 
and how we respond to God's offer of forgiveness, it ends up saying a lot about us, doesn't it? Am I grateful? Oh, Jesus, I'm so grateful. I'm relieved to have the grace of Christ. Or am I offended? Our culture gets offended. It really does in a lot of ways. It gets offended by the message of Christianity once they really understand it. Like they get, oh man, you're just, are you saying as a Christian you like love everybody? I like that. That's cool. I'm down with that. But I'm like, yeah, but I'm also saying everybody's a sinner who deserves judgment. And they need God's grace and Jesus is the only way. And they're like, you know what? Nah. Nah, I don't want that. That does not, it's just not good for me. I don't, I don't enjoy that. That doesn't make me feel good. Our culture has us affirming things, though, that aren't true. It's like a trend in our culture right now. I'm affirming things that are factually not true about people. Like they're just completely making things up. And then I'm supposed to affirm it like it's, like it's a fact of reality. And I'm like a bigot if I don't affirm it. And I'm like, this is, this is nonsense. On, in, in any way you cut it, this is nonsense. But this is the same thing as telling a sinner that they're not a sinner. By telling a wicked person they don't need forgiveness. We're told we should support people's choices no matter what. That's one of the craziest things I've ever heard. Support their choices? What if they choose to murder people? I don't support that. What if they, they choose to backstab their friends? What if they choose to deny Christ? Yeah, I don't support those choices. And because I love those people, I'm certainly, and because I love God, I'm not going to support every choice a person makes. But this is, it's just, it's weird uh, trying to interact with a culture that has such a high view of self that I want you to lie about reality lest you offend me. And um, all I can say is the heat will rise for those who will continue to speak truth in our culture. Yet we're needed more than ever. We're needed more than ever. And we're going to be confronting the pride of people as we do this, as we just are honest with them about their sin issues and about where they stand before God and how I can't affirm everything that you decide. And it, you can't just use a phrase like love is love and now all of a sudden whatever you decide to do with your life is approved by God. No. It's just not, it's not reality. And so I can't affirm that. And I may be hated for it, but as long as I don't hate back and, and I'm not overcome by evil, but try to overcome evil by good, all that kind of stuff. We're just trying to navigate all these issues, whether it comes to homosexuality or transgenderism or, or the universalism. Oh, like, oh, everybody's going to be saved. Don't worry in the end. Or the all roads lead to God and all this. It's just nonsense, but it's friendly nonsense. It's like really nice nonsense, you know? It's like bad theology, but in the form of a unicorn, you know? It's so pretty. And it's got rainbows on it and stuff. So it's okay, right? But uh, Satan disguises himself as a unicorn <laughs> or an angel of light or something. Bad theology, the worst theology, is usually really nice. Really, really nice. Just like Satan in the Garden of Eden. What did he tell her? You won't die. You won't die. What kind of mean person told you you would die? Oh my gosh. Can't they respect your choices? Yeah, you'll die. <laughs> like, you will. And that's where we are, unfortunately, um, in our culture. So the man himself, the man, he gets told, you're forgiven. I think he could have been really disappointed. I don't know if he was disappointed or not. I don't want to put that on the guy. Maybe not. Maybe he was relieved. Maybe he was more relieved than even had he been healed, right? To just know he's forgiven. He, maybe he was just utterly and totally relieved. And I would understand if he was, because forgiveness is not only are my sins forgiven, and now I'm right with God. My relationship with God is restored, the most important relationship in life. I'm now in the kingdom of God, because forgiveness paves the way to being in God's kingdom. I will experience the resurrection, a new body that can jump and skip and leap and walk, an incorruptible body to be in glory forever with the joys of eternity forever. So I'm like, I'm going to take forgiveness over anything, any other thing that God might want to give me if I have to pick. Forgiveness is greater than immediate healing any day of the week. Seeing this, I think will really strengthen us. And I wonder if we see it right now. Like, do you in your life, with whatever pain you've been dealing with the past like week or 10 years, 
do you see the forgiveness of Christ as greater than a healing from that thing? And that's like really important that you do. Um, I think it will strengthen us in trials, and I think that's a biblical fact. In Romans 8.18, it says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. And don't you think Paul knew about real suffering? Real suffering. The loss of loved ones. Right? The, the suffering of physical pain and hardship. Being backstabbed dealing with all manner of hardship and issue. And he's like, yes, oh, I've been there. The sufferings this time can be intense, can be stuff where you don't have words to express how hard it is. Yet, when you compare that to the glory that's coming, there's no comparison. There is just no comparison. And that's what lifts our hearts. It's not how great our lives are today. It's how wonderful eternity is in Christ that encourages us. <clears throat> Sometimes we understand our pain, but we are blind to the glory that is coming. And, um, and that hurts us. And that hurts us. So then the scribes respond. Uh, Jesus forgives the man, and then the scribes respond in verse 6. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? They call it blasphemy. This is, there's, they, have, they had actually had like a technical use of the word blasphemy and, and what Jesus did doesn't fit the technical use. They would also use it in more of a casual sense. Like, it's just blasphemy. It's like, how could you say that? And it seems to be in that sense that they mean this. They're saying only God can truly forgive sin, right? You can forgive people. You guys get this, I think, right? Well, you can, I can forgive somebody, but I haven't forgiven their sin before God. I can even say, you know, I, you know Ben, you're looking at me mean all night, but I forgive you but God's still going to get you for that. But no, I'm not, you know, he wasn't looking at me mean, but, but let's suppose he was, you know. And then the idea is this, though, that any sin I do against any human being is also a sin against God because God is the grounding of all goodness and, and holiness. Because he's the one I'm accountable to. So that everything I do, it's like when two kids fight after their parents have told them to get along, they've sinned against each other, but they've also sinned against the parents in their rebellion against what their parents have said. There's a sense in which every sin is ultimately against God, and human forgiveness doesn't get rid of the divine issue. So, Jesus, how are you forgiving this man? How are you giving him divine forgiveness? You can't do this. That's, that's blasphemy. And ultimately, it would be something kind of blasphemous to falsely promise forgiveness. It would be, and I think this is good to know for those who pre preach altered versions of the gospel of Christ. And they promise forgiveness to people who don't know Jesus and don't have forgiveness. One missionary I met, she told me that she was a missionary. Um, <clears throat> and she said she would go up into Canada and she would find um, Native American tribes and she would minister to them. And she said she would give them a revelation that she received one day when she was in church and they were worshiping. And I was like, really? What's the revelation? And she says, and this is word for word quote, I remember it, because the heresy of it was forever embedded into my soul, <laughs> she told me. Um, and she says, there is no judgment, there is only love. That's a feel-good message right there. Does that make you feel good? Wouldn't it be great if that was true? But, but if it's not true, then what is it? Blasphemy. And it wasn't true. I said, what about when Hebrews where it tells us that it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment? And she said, oh, I believe that too. And I said, but how? And then she didn't want to talk anymore. Well, it is blasphemous to tell somebody that they're forgiven when they're not. It's nice, but it's arrogant and wrong. Nice in the sense of it feels good. It's actually mean. It's like, a, it's like a doctor telling you that your cancer's gone when it's not. There is no cancer. There's only health. Oh, man, that really blesses my heart to hear that. I am so relieved. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Dead. You know, it's like this is not help. You're an evil man with a smile when you promise forgiveness outside of Christ. That's the ultimate result. And so it would be wrong. 
But this is, this is Jesus. He's offering forgiveness. Obviously, it's not blasphemy. They just don't understand who he is and what authority he has. And this is kind of a theme in Mark now because it's the second time that forgiveness has been offered apart from the temple. What was the first time? Anybody remember? Where forgiveness is being offered with no temple, no sacrifice. It was the baptism of John. I offer a baptism of repentance for forgiveness, saying that you need to believe in him who's coming after me. I'm going to just repent and believe and I'm going to be forgiven. That's the idea. And here's Jesus. Comes up and he's forgiving people. This is the second time this has happened. Jesus, of course, is going to be the sacrifice that achieves the forgiveness he's talking about. So the baptism in here. So I would say in this, we're not saying God just forgives. And there are some teachers out there who will say this. God just forgives. There's no, there's no payment for the sin. There's no sin dealt with on the cross kind of issue. He just forgives. It's just forgiven. No issue of any kind. Um, that's not the case. Um, even in the case of the baptism, or, you know, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Even in the case of Jesus saying, you're forgiven, he then later goes and purchases that forgiveness. He still accomplishes it. Jesus forgives in light of his own sacrifice. And the temple is a template of this. And so Jesus isn't doing the same thing as the temple, identical. He's fulfilling what it pictures, though. And in the temple, there is no forgiveness apart from the shedding of blood. So there's a, a cost that needs to be paid. I bring this up because there's a, a growing in popularity. There's different teachers right now that are trying to say that God just forgives and no sacrifice is needed, including Jesus. Like, it's just not necessary. God just forgives. Um, and that would just disagree with, like, the Bible. In verse 8, we read, Immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Verse 8 tells us that Jesus was aware in his spirit. I think that's really interesting. Um, now, the commentators debate um, on this issue. And it's not like if you open a commentary, whatever they say is law. And some of them say, hey, Jesus was aware in his spirit. This is like a divine or supernatural knowledge. Others say, well, the spirit here just means like his mind. And he just sort of figured it out. Like he just like looked at him and was like, I know what they're thinking. Um, I think the way it's implied, the way it's written, it, it seems more like it's talking about supernatural knowledge to me. Um, it doesn't just say, like, he could tell what they were doing. It's, he was just aware in his spirit. He, was just, he just knew it. Um, so in my Im impression, it's perhaps a moment of supernatural knowledge that Christ has. And this brings up another theme in the Gospels, which is how the heart of man responds to God's revelation. It's kind of a tricky thing. Um, here the revelation is Jesus speaks the truth of God. He does healings. He offers forgiveness. And it reveals what's inside the hearts of these men. Like the Gospel of John says, they loved the darkness. That's why they didn't receive Christ. Right? They were already loving the darkness when they heard the message of Christ. Jesus didn't come to people who'd never heard anything before. They had general revelation and they had special revelation, both in creation as well as in God's word. And how they had reacted to those two things ended up being how they reacted to Jesus in a lot of ways. So when Jesus says, if you believed Moses, you would have, you'd believe me. He's saying they'd already really rejected Moses, even though they would teach Moses. He tells the parable of the soils to talk about this, right? When the seed goes out, the only difference is the soils. The soils are the conditions of different people in their hearts and lives. So there's something about when the gospel goes out, people react differently to it based not on how amazing the orator is, but on the condition of their heart. And we often fail to remember this. Um, we sometimes judge all of the teachers and leaders and, you know, someone's preaching the gospel and you're like, Oh, let me see. Of course, it's my job to evaluate everything they do now. And let me think if that was a proper or not, if they did a good job. I give them a 7 out of 10, but that guy didn't like the message, so they must have failed somehow. Well, sometimes it's just the heart of the person. The hearer is mad because they're already rejecting God, and now they're confronted with even more of his light. Sometimes that's the case. So I do think persuasion is important and convincing people is important. They're part of sharing the gospel, but they're not the heart of the gospel. At the heart of it is just a proclamation of Christ, his death, resurrection, believing and trusting in him for forgiveness. Repent and believe, that's the heart of it. And whether or not we respond often just reveals what's in us. Um, we don't want to add offense to it as Christians. I don't want to make it harder. I don't want to do it calloused as though how I communicate doesn't matter. But I don't want to act like the parable of the sower doesn't mean anything. 
right? The seed goes out into different kinds of soils. But as much as I'll say um, Jesus is like showing, revealing that there's something wrong with their hearts, he still reasons with them. He doesn't just abandon them. You apostates, I'm out. Instead, he reasons with them. Like look at verse 9. He talks to them. He goes, okay, you're having a problem. You have a roadblock when it comes to believing. So he says, which is, it e- which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk? It's just, I, I've spent, I don't know how much time evaluating this question over the years. Like, every time I come across it, I go, which is easier? To say you're forgiven or to say, get up and walk? And I'm like, well, if you're being honest, the hardest one to do is, I think, would be forgiving people, not making them healed. I think if, if you were speaking truth, if like your words were really having power, which would be the would require more power or something like that, to put it crudely. I think forgiveness over healing. But which one's easier to just, to just lie about? Well, it's, I mean, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. I'll be like, get up and walk. Oh, no. Now everybody knows I'm making stuff up, right? Because you didn't get up. So in one sense, one's easier. In another sense, another one's easier. But I don't think it's ultimately the point as much as I like like thinking about these things. The point is, is that either of these is quite a task and Jesus is partnering them together. So he then, after asking them, which one's easier? To say you're forgiven or to say get up and walk? Verse 10, but so that you may know, know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And this is key here. Jesus is going to provide evidence to prove who he is. He's not opposed to evidence. There's a type of apologetics that they call it. It's not really apologetics. It's called presuppositional apologetics. There's a style of that within that, within presuppositional apologetics, the umbrella, there's like a group within that says it's wrong to give people evidence. And Jesus does it. And the Bible does it. And the Gospels do it. And the book of Acts does it. It's, it's not wrong. Jesus does it here in verse 10. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So that you may know. That was the reason. I want you to know Jesus gives them evidence. Sometimes Jesus gives evidence. Other times Jesus doesn't give them nothing. Here Jesus is like, here's the evidence. At another point, he goes, no sign will be given to you. Why? Because they'd already been given a bunch of signs and they'd, they'd turn their backs on them. So it was a point at which God's like, no, no sign, except for the resurrection of Christ, the ultimate sign. The point is that the miracles of Jesus teach us about Jesus' authority and who he is. And that, that's absolutely clear in this passage. It's clear earlier in Mark and it will continue to be clear as we go through Mark. The miracles of Jesus aren't saying, go out, find someone with this affliction and try to reduplicate what Jesus did. They're trying to tell you something about who Jesus is. I think that's the main thing. He tells him, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And I want you to just like teleport yourself there for a second. Jesus is there. The anticipation is really high. The room is crowded. The house is full. You can't even get more people in. All of a sudden you hear the scratching noise on the roof above. And they're ripping out the roof. They're digging through the mud and pulling the branches out. And then they lower this guy down onto the ground. And everyone at that point is like, what is Jesus going to do? Right? He could rebuke them for this. He could be like, I'm out of here. Who knows what's going to happen next? He tells the man, you're forgiven. This starts a whole controversy with the, with the scribes, right? They're like, what? You can't say that. Jesus says, okay, to prove that I can, get up and walk. And I just imagine it got really quiet. And everybody went from looking at Jesus to looking at the guy on the ground. And he got up and he picks up his pallet and he walks out through the crowd and goes home. And now where's everybody's eyes? Back on Jesus. Who is this guy? He can forgive sins. He just proved it. What is going on? That's the idea. <clears throat> How exciting. Jesus proved he could forgive by raising the paralytic. And I think that this is like a little mini picture of Jesus proving that he can forgive by raising from the dead. 
His resurrection is the ultimate miracle that puts the seal of proof on his ministry. And what blows me away, especially when I studied the resurrection and um, have a few times over the years, spent a lot of time on it, is the amount of evidence that still survives 2,000 years later to give proof for the, for the fact that, re- that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Like this just blows me away from the, the testimony of multiple different accounts um, who seal it in their own blood. Um, the, this blows me away. If you ever think, am I really forgiven Jesus? You need to stop and say, is Jesus really risen? Because if he's risen, you're forgiven. If your faith is in Christ and Jesus is alive, well, then you can't die. I love that, that these truths are grounded in like these historical realities that we can grab onto. Okay, finally, there's one more thing I want to share with you guys. And it's about this phrase, the son of man. I skipped over it briefly, but it's in verse 10. Um, and then I want to highlight it because it's just neat. This is the first time Jesus uses the phrase son of man. He says, but so that you may know the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. This is Jesus' favorite title for himself. And pretty much nobody ever uses it about Jesus. He uses it about himself. Almost no one ever uses it referring to him. They call him Lord. They call him Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't call him the Son of Man. That's like very rare. Jesus uses it 14 times of himself in the Gospel of Mark alone, 14 different times, which is quite a lot. And what we think about when we hear the phrase Son of Man is we think it means Jesus is human. He's human. He's the son of man. So he's human. And that's true, but there's so much more there. I do have a video online about the topic, Jesus, son of man. You could watch that video sometime. But what I want to do today that I thought would be fun was to just survey the 14 uses Jesus has of son of man in the gospel of Mark. So I'm not going to read through these verses. I'm just going to give you the things that Jesus says about himself when he says that he's the son of man. Because I just, this is the kind of stuff you can do on your own. I just put son of man in the search. And I looked at all the passages in Mark where Jesus calls himself son of man. And I thought it was cool. So I thought I'd share it with you. But this is the kind of stuff you could do, obviously, on your own, your own Bible study. But the first one is uh, Mark 2.10, which we just read. And when Jesus says he's the son of man here, what is he telling us about himself? He has the authority to forgive sin. So so the son of man has the authority to forgive sin. In Mark 2.28... We learn the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Ooh, that'll be fun when we get there, talk about what that means. But he's the Lord of the Sabbath. Think about how big of a claim that is. Who's the Lord of the Sabbath? I mean, that's got to be God. The Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. In Mark 8, 31, he says the Son of Man must, must, not might, not will, but must be betrayed, suffer, die, and rise again. The same one who can forgive, the same one who's Lord of the Sabbath, he has to be betrayed, suffer, die, and rise again. In Mark 8, 38, we're told that you better not be ashamed of the Son of Man or he'll be ashamed of you when he comes in his kingdom. The idea in Mark 8, 38 is that the Son of Man is the access point to getting into the kingdom. And your treatment of him is, is going to indicate whether or not you're going to be in the kingdom. That's a big deal. In Mark 9, 9, the Son of Man will rise from the dead. In Mark 9, 12, again, we're told he will suffer and he'll be treated with contempt. In Mark 9, 31, again, we're told he'll be betrayed, killed, and on the third day, he'll rise again. This is a repeated thing about the Son of Man. It's over and over again, and this is important that it is. In Mark 10, 33, he'll be betrayed to the chief priests and scribes who will condemn him to death, and then they'll deliver him to the Gentiles. Jesus predicts exactly how this stuff's going to happen. He'll, he'll get a betrayal, which will be happen from someone on his inside crowd. He'll be given first to the chief priests and scribes, and then they will condemn him and send him to the Gentiles. This is exactly what happened in the uh, trial and crucifixion of Jesus. In Mark 10, 45, we learn this thing about the Son of Man. Oh, he can forgive. He's, a Lord of, he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's all this stuff. But he didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And that word ransom is really important. It meant that his life was going to buy people back to God. This is like that whole substitutionary atonement thing coming right from the words of Jesus. 
In Mark 13, 26, we read that in the future, people will see the Son of Man coming, a second coming, right? They'll see him coming in the clouds with power and great glory, or great glory. Sometimes I like to read that verse wrong. So there's a second coming, and he's going to be coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Initially, he's coming to serve and to suffer and die and rise again, and then he'll come again with great glory. Sorry, I just told jokes to entertain myself. In Mark 14, 21, we get the phrase Son of Man twice in this passage. But it says that the Son of Man goes just as it is written of him. And you might miss the profoundness of this. He says, as it is written of him. Written. Meaning that all the stuff that's going to happen to Jesus was written ahead of time in prophecy in the word of God. And so the Son of Man is coming to fulfill prophecy as well. In Mark 14, 41, Jesus is in the garden here, and he says the Son of Man is being betrayed. He knew the moment was happening, he said it was going to happen, and he purposely succumbed to it. Now, side note, Bart Ehrman, one of, one of the skeptics I reference a lot, he likes to say that in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus doesn't really know what's going on. He's confused and in despair when he's going to the cross. And I'm like, how many times did he say it was going to happen? Here he is getting betrayed. He's like, I'm being betrayed. Like, just in case, I want you to miss it. <laughs> Remember how I said I was going to be betrayed? And the chief priests, they're going to condemn me. They're give me the Gentiles. They're going to kill me. Then I'm going to rise again from the dead. Yeah, and then later I'm going to come in the clouds with glory and great glory. And all that, yes, all of that's going to happen. Bart Ehrman doesn't read the Bible um, correctly. <laughs> he reads it. He probably memorizes passages in Greek, I imagine. But knowledge isn't always the thing. The last passage. Mark 14, 62, the son of man is the one who's going to come and rule the eternal kingdom of God. Wham, bam, son of man. Like he is exalted. He's this high, yes, he's human. We get this idea he's human, son of man, but he's this exalted, glorious figure who has the authority to forgive sins. He is the Lord of the Sabbath, yet he's working really hard. And this, this is the theme in Mark. He's working really hard, and this is throughout the Gospels, to undo the false messianic expectations the Jews had at the time. They only saw the second coming. And he's like, no, 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 no. Yeah, that's coming. I'm coming. Oh, yeah, that's, that's future. But right now I'm here to serve. Right now I'm here to suffer and to die for your sins, to ransom you back to God. So Jesus in the Gospels, it's not this like messianic secret. It's rather an unveiling it's rather a revealing of the true mission of the Messiah all along. That he came to save us so that when he comes to a kingdom, it'll be a kingdom populated by redeemed people who God loves. That's the idea. The Son of Man will rule, but first he will suffer, he will serve, he will die, and he will rise again. And your faith in him is what will determine your access into his kingdom when he comes. Pretty cool stuff. All from Jesus. All from the Gospel of Mark. Just the Gospel of Mark and his references of Son of Man. So next week, um, we'll deal with Jesus and the Sabbath and a confusing parable about wineskins. Remember the parable of the wineskins, old and new wineskins? We'll talk about that. And it's constantly used wrong by people. They use the, oh, I'll talk about it next week. People use that parable just to rip on anybody they want to rip on. <clears throat> and we'll talk about a radically misrepresented event when Jesus ate with the sinners which I can't wait because sometimes I'm like, oh, good. Here's a passage I can finally talk about, you know, because we're coming across it verse by verse and it's just misused all the time. And so I'm excited to uh, get to discuss it. So um, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the son of man, that you came and you took on our flesh so that you could go to the cross and take on our sin so that we could be forgiven as you ransomed us back to God. We're thankful, Lord, that as you rose from the dead, we have that confidence in the grace of Christ. And it is only by the grace of God that we present ourselves. We, we remind ourselves again tonight, we do not stand by our works or our goodness, but by the forgiveness and grace of Jesus Christ alone. You have covered our sin. You have taken our weakness. You have, you have ransomed us to God. And we stand and present ourselves to you by the mercies of Christ. 
Lord, we love you. We bless your holy name. We pray that um, as we go forward this week, we would be able to serve you with hearts of hope, and we would pray without losing heart. And Lord, whatever trials, no matter how great they be, Lord, may we have a greater vision, we pray, of heaven and eternal glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.